Hey, welcome to Advanced Directives with Angular Part 2. This video has been a long time coming. The first screencast called Advanced Directives with Angular actually came out almost well, over two years ago. Uh, and so you might be wondering, is it relevant to do an updated screencast on Angular 1.4, which this was using at the time, which was the current version when things like Angular 2 are out, or React, or even things like Vue. I know a lot of people have moved on, uh, but I had a, enough comments on YouTube uh, requesting part two, and I did hint to part two in part one of the uh, first screencast um, that I thought it'd be good to do. And I think the things that we're going to go over in this screencast are useful enough that they sort of transcend even the evolution of Angular 1.x to 2.x and some of the other frameworks and tools uh, that have come out. And so let's take a look at lo what we're going to check out today in part two. Uh, this won't be as long a screencast as part one, uh, but hopefully it'll still leave you with some good information. Uh, and like I said, something that sort of transcends uh, the framework specific changes that have happened in Angular. And it'll still be relevant even if you're using Angular 2 or uh, one of those other frameworks like Vue or React or, or something like that. Um, so in the first screencast, we had a bug fix. And if you recall, we built a DSL out of these grid directives. Uh, and the goal was to show how Angular can be used to craft um, a DSL or a domain specific language with HTML that allows us to be a little bit more expressive in how we do things. And maybe the goal is to build this DSL so that a non-technical user who doesn't understand HTML, but uh, would, you know, have a limited subset of uh, HTML um, like elements that they could use to compose user interfaces. And that was the goal. So we had this grid screen, uh, we defined the columns uh, with some metadata about those. And the uh, the other thing we had was an inline editor. And all of this was the, the output of this uh, markup or this DSL was this table that comes on the screen. One of the first bugs that we introduced was when you click on this arrow, we get an inline editor that shows up below the row that you're, that you're wanting to edit. And these are bound. Uh, we did the code in the first screencast. Uh, so if you haven't checked it out, you can go check that out now. Um, but these are all bound so that I can change these to pants. Uh, and these are blue pants and they cost 50. And you can see that it's bound to the original row. So this is like a very rudimentary inline editor. And the thing that triggered that was this directive, this attribute directive called with inline editor. Uh, so the bug that we had was if you click this multiple times, uh, you'll see that I'm getting multiple editors. And that's not very useful. I mean, I can change this to a shirt, uh, but now I have four editors and that seems to be a bug. So we're going to spend some time in and fix that one. Um, the next thing you'll notice is just, I, I put this in the extra credit in the first video, was uh, this arrow actually doesn't change at all. Uh, and it'd be nice to, uh, when when you're editing, uh, it points down, and when you're not editing, maybe it's a toggle and it and snaps back. So we're going to do that feature as well. Um, but the biggest thing that I wanted to cover, and the, and the thing I alluded to earlier with something that sort of transcends the features that have changed in Angular 1.4 all the way up to 2 and, and these other frameworks, is the idea that uh, we built our own implementation for the output of this DSL, which is, you know, this very rudimentary table uh, that's rendered to the screen. Uh, but wouldn't it be cool if we could still use our directives, but have it as an interface to a third party library, maybe something like um, JS Grid, maybe you use something like jQuery data tables, there's a whole bunch of different JavaScript table plugins that are out there. It's actually really, really hard to find one that's good. I remember back in the day, I used to use the YUI data tables, uh, and that was sort of the most robust feature tested version. But um, the point is, uh, you can pick whichever uh, jQuery or whichever JavaScript table plugin. But the idea that we can take our DSL, make a few minor tweaks to it, not have to change a whole lot, and get a vastly different output, um, and that there's a lot of value in doing that, uh, and that we don't have to throw away all of our directives that we created. Um, and Angular actually lets us do that really well. So to start with, let's dive in and let's fix uh, the bug where we have the duplicate um, editors showing up. And if you remember from the first, uh, the code is actually all the same. I'm going to be walking through the code here. So let's take a look at, uh, I think it's in grid directives. And we had a whole bunch of directives that sort of define all this stuff. And I'm going to collapse a bunch of these until we get to the one that we actually want to look at. Um, if you remember correctly, from the first screencast, we had uh, an editor initializer. And if we take a look at that template, we can see that it was just this very tiny anchor element. Let me just set up the dock here so that this can go below. There we go. And we'll take a look at that here so you can see it. 
and I'm going to make that a little bit bigger. There we go. So here's our editor initializer, and uh, what happens is when you click on this, uh, it calls the edit function and introduces that editor. Uh, and you can see where that is defined here. We had a controller uh, with the edit function that was defined, and then we broadcasted to some other listener that hey we wanted to uh, we wanted to edit this specific row um, and then in the linking function uh, we listen to that uh, because the linking function is the place again where we have access to the element and in angular if you're going to be doing any manipulation of the dom you want the place closest to where you have access to the element so you don't have to store references to it all over the place uh, and the code here just to review um, it creates a compiled version of the editor template we can take a look at that really quick. Let me get them both into view here. Um, a compiled version of the editor template uh, because this would be specific to the row that we are editing. Uh, and then it's, it inserts it after the TR, which is this TR, using some jQuery selector magic to figure out um, the current element look up the parents chain and grab the TR. Uh, so that's what's doing it. And the reason that it's duplicating it is because uh, anytime we click on this, we're just broadcasting edit. And there's nothing bounding that to say, oh, well, maybe we shouldn't compile it if we're already in editing mode uh, and we have the state. So let's do that first. Uh, the first thing that we need to do is we need to add somewhere to track that state. And we can do that uh, in Angular with the scope. So let's say that we've got scope.editing and the default state of that is false. And then now, now that we have some way to look at uh, the state of editing, now we can change it uh, so that we can toggle that when edit is called. So the first thing that we're gonna wanna do here, um, and remember this dollar scope from the controller is the exact same as the scope that's injected in the linking function. There's just two different phases, and if you're interested in what those are, you can check out my earlier screencasts on Angular that talk about the life cycle phases of when these functions are defined. But linking happens before controller gets executed is all you need to know here. And so what we wanna do is when we click on that, we wanna toggle that state, and the easiest way to do that uh, is just to set uh, scope.editing to the inverse of whatever scope.editing is and we could take a look um, at whether that's working but we need also some way for the UI to know whether it needs to comp to compile or not and now that we have the editing state in place uh, and it's being toggled uh, we can do that by just adding a conditional so we don't always want to compile this template we only want to do that um, if we're editing is when we're going to actually inject the editor. So we can just add a, a conditional uh, and we're going to have two conditions, one if we're editing and one if we're not. So a simple if else will, will help us there. So if we're editing, um, we want to uh, make our editor. So let's move this line into here. Um, and we don't necessarily need a var, a temporary variable, because we're not going to be doing it every time. So we could also store the editor uh, that we're creating. So let's do that by putting it on scope.editor. Uh, and now this would run, and if we're editing, it would still recompile it every time. And we actually don't need to do that. And because we're storing it uh, on editor, we can memoize it so that future clicks on this thing, because remember we're in a single page app, we're not issuing a, a reload on the entire web page. Future clicks on this uh, won't trigger the compile. So we can say that the scope.editor is equal to the scope.editor, um, or uh, if we don't have an instance of that, if it's the first time, then we want to compile the template uh, and grab our editor. So that sets, sets us up to have an actual editor. Uh, and then if we are, uh, if we've got an editor, this is where we want to insert it after. So we want to create our editor only if we don't have one um, so that we, it's a little bit of a performance optimization so that we're not recompiling every time. Um, and so if we're not editing, then we just want to take that editor and we want to remove it. Um, and that's only going to remove it from the DOM. That's not going to delete anything off the scope. And so it's really nice because um, this line won't execute in for further invocations and we can just take a look at uh, how that's how that's working now in the browser. So if I reload this guy, um, let's just go into sources. I'm going to make this window a little bit bigger so we can kind of see. And let's look at grid directives. And let's I'm just going to look for scope dot editing. And let's add a breakpoint here just to see how this is all working. So I'm going to click. We're in our breakpoint. And we can see that uh, if I bring the locals over here, collapse the call stack, 
uh, and we look at the scope. So right now, scope.editing is false. That's because of the default that we set. So if we step over that, scope.editing is going to be true, uh, in which case uh, this conditional should apply. Scope.editor uh, doesn't exist yet, but it's going to exist after we step over this. So now we have a template, and then we can insert it after the right element. Oh, and we have a bug. Let's see. Editor is not defined. Right, because I called it scope.editor. So we need to make sure our reference is right. And if we reload, let's see if that works now. And I'm going to kill the console here. And so now we've got a toggle working, and we don't have the, the duplicate um, problem. So that fixes one of our issues, and that's a fairly simple way to do it. There are other ways that you could do this. Uh, I had some people propose solutions using ng-if in the actual template. Um, the thing I didn't like about that was it moves the logic away from the JavaScript code and into the HTML. Uh, and for most things in Angular, I like the templates to be fairly dumb, and I like most of my application logic to live in linking functions or controllers. And so that's generally why I'll opt to do um, most of my sort of conditional logic or business logic, if you want to call it that, inside of my linking or controller functions. Cool, so that fixes um, don't insert the duplicate editors. What about toggling the arrow for the inline editor? Which is a, is a good next feature. And so the original implementation, if we remember, taking a look at the editor initializer, has this HTML entity uh, 9654, um, which maps to this right-facing triangle. And uh, one thing that we can do is we can actually control that with uh, CSS using the generated content property. And so uh, one thing that we want to do in order to be able to do that, we want to put the local state of whether we're editing or not um, on the actual element itself. And the way that we can do that is right here where we have editing now, uh, we can grab um, the, the parent TR, which is where we're going to store uh, that editing state. Let me just flip this window back that way. Uh, so again, the parent TR is this TR here. Let me pop open DevTools, that'll be a lot clearer. So yeah, this TR is where we're going to store the editor editing state um, as a class. And right now it just has an ng-scope class, which is the default for what Angular puts in there. So let's grab um, that TR, which is this selector. Uh, and then we want to toggle a class. Uh, there's a jQuery method called toggle class. And if you're, just as a side note, if you're looking for the best way to look up jQuery API uh, references, I go to jqapi.com because it's super fast. And then you can go toggle class. I click on that, and we can see that the toggle class method signature is overloaded. It has a couple of different uh, ways you can invoke it. And the one that I really like to use uh, is the second one here, where you say toggle a class name on an element, um, and then the switch property, which if we read the docs is a Boolean um, value to determine whether the class should be added or removed. So if it's a falsy, uh, then it will remove the class, and if it's a truthy, then it will add the class, which is really nice because we have a Boolean value set up for editing um, that automatically switches when the user clicks on this. So we can say that we want to toggle the class editing, and we want to bind that to scope.editing. So let's see what that does for us. So if I click on this guy, now you can see that when it's open and the editor's there, I'm editing. And when it's not, uh, it's gone. So that, that's one half of what we needed to do to uh, get the, the toggle feature working. And um, so what we need to do next is we actually need to pull in uh, some style updates. So if we look at, let me go back to one window here. Let's go to our index.html. I didn't have any style sheets in this application. So we had a few style rules. Um, one basically just to do some default styling for um, the table itself. Let's, let's add a few more rules. Uh, let's say that we want to do, um, we want to have all of our A or our anchor elements. First, we want to do a, just a minor improvement. Um, we want to put a cursor pointer on there so that when you mouse over these, uh, we get the, the, the pointer instead of just the arrow so that it's actually clickable. Um, it's also nice because uh, it's hard to tell the clickable area because these anchor elements aren't set to uh, display block or anything like that. Um, they're just basically just set to display inline. So the bounding box only takes up what you can see there in the blue rectangle. So cursor pointer just gives the user a clue uh, about where they can click on this thing. 
and it's a little bit nicer. Cool. So that's like a minor accessibility improvement. Uh, so let's add our generated content. And the way that we do that is with CSS pseudo selectors. Uh, so there's, um, there is before and there's after that we can use. We don't need to use both. We'll just use one. And we'll grab that. And then we'll use the content property. And what the content property does is it allows us to actually insert generated content um, into the markup using CSS, which is pretty cool. Uh, and I use this quite often for U small UI elements like this. Um, and with the pl proliferation of uh, icon libraries that are translating all of their icons to Unicode characters, um, this becomes a really powerful way to get a low cost, really cheap, um, imageless UI uh, that's not SVG, because that might have a, a little bit more of an investment cost in, in developing. But um, you can use Unicode to basically add icons without using images and without incurring an HTTP request. And so if you remember, we looked at the editor initializer. We had this HTML entity. So we're going to take that out of there. And um, what the content property is going to do is we want to select in CSS this, this anchor element. So that's what uh, we're doing here. And we want to the content property is going to look at um, the before actually would put, so if we had like a value in here, before would select right here and after would select right here, uh, but within the, um, the bounds of that element. And so we can say a Unicode value here and the Unicode value for, uh, it's not this, I'm just going to put this in a comment. So that was our right arrow. Um, it, it, you need to have a slash to escape it and it's 25B6. So now if we take this and we look, it's, it looks the same, but if we take a look at this uh, and we look in, let me get rid of the console there. And you can see the pseudo element right there, colon, colon, before Chrome DevTools does a nice job of showing us that. And you can see the rule that applies to it. And if I toggle it off, um, you can see that the arrow goes away. Cool. So that's one state. And then we need to uh, add the other one. And so the way that we do that, uh, now that we have our editing class on the table row here, uh, where are we? Way back up here. We have the editing class. I really like to use sort of the parent element um, classes as a way to target state uh, for styling. And so we can leverage that and we can say that anything with a class of editing and inside of that, uh, use our same selector, we're going to change that content uh, to be the down arrow, which is 25BC. So let's reload that. Nice. Now we have our toggle. So those are two pretty easy ways to do that. And I just wanted to add those to this video because I left those as open questions uh, or extra credit. And I, a number of people were asking, well, how do you, how would you do this? Um, and this is sort of the first thing that, that came to mind for, for how I would do it. Again, uh, the, the key takeaways are not leveraging ng ifs or any directives in my HTML to keep my templates fairly dumb, but um, putting my application logic in the JavaScript where it should live. And also, um, uh, controlling state and using the power of CSS and generated content uh, to, to control some of those UI elements so that I don't need images or I don't need SVG or anything like that for my icons. Cool. So that covers one and two. We, we covered the bug fix. We covered the, the inline editor feature. And now what I'd really like to talk about is what I sort of hinted at the beginning of being able to keep our same API here, uh, but be able to basically go to a third party library, um, something like this jQuery plugin. Um, and the reason this might be desirable is you might still want to provide uh, users, non-technical users, with a, a way to define markup in their web pages that um, Maybe they don't understand HTML, but they still want to get a really robust UI. Uh, but our UI kind of has hit the point of, you know, we don't want to write, have to write it anymore, but we still want to be able to use this as our interface. And Angular is really great for that. Uh, and so what I want to show you is how to take this um, JS Grid plugin. If we take a look at demos, I'll just show you kind of what it looks like. So it's got pagination, uh, it's got inline editing, and it's a little bit nicer inline editing because uh, it just does it. It replaces the row with those elements, and I can delete items and things like that. So um, the value you get by relying on a third-party library is, you know, they've paid the maintenance cost, hopefully up front, if it's a good plugin. It's robust. It has good browser support. All that kind of stuff that you don't have to develop, right? But you can still have your custom directive sort of be the the uh, interface to that. So let's take a look at what that's gonna what's gonna need to happen there. 
And just to jog your memory, uh, the place that we are loading our data from is this uh, data.js in API. And I'm just going to close this. So let's look at that. It's really simple, um, not a lot of data in here. Uh, so this data is driving it. And we had some application logic uh, that looked at the resource attribute of the grid screen directive and went and fetched that. So let's just jog your memory on what that is doing. Uh, we can see right here in the grid screen directive, again, this guy with the resource, um, the thing that it does first in its linking function is it goes and fetches that using Angular's HTTP, dollar HTTP service, get that when we've got it. Um, then we've got our rows, which maps to the data. And then we broadcasted this event, which was ready to render uh, with the rows and the columns. So let's just do some inspection work to see that that's actually working. And let's go look at that ready to render event. Um, and the place that we uh, made use of that was in the grid um, directive. And the reason that we did that uh, was because that's this directive here. Um, uh, the grid screen, if you remember the order that the uh, linking functions execute in, uh, it goes inside out um, and bottom to top inside out basically. So the last uh, linking function to get executed, I think we had logging in here. Um, yeah, we can see. And we can see that uh, the columns go first, then the columns, then inline editor, the attribute directive, um, and then uh, our editor initializer. Um, but the last one to go is the grid screen one. And I think I got rid of my log in the linking function. Um, but that's why we broadcast it here, because it's at that point in time, in the life cycle of, of the application, uh, the, the data is ready. Let's, let's go back to uh, ready to render, and let's just log that out so we can see uh, when that's happening. Uh, so we're going to log, uh, this is ready to render, and we've got rows and calls. And let's take a look at what that maps to in our console. So here we go. There's rows, which is um, uh, the data for each row that's showing up. So we've got uh, the widget first, and then columns. Um, and if you remember correctly, we pushed on to the very start one of these columns called edit, uh, which maps to this column and the, the UI element. And so that was sort of a hack that we used to manipulate the data uh, to get that to work. So we want to take uh, this data structure that we've got internally, um, pulling from, uh, if we look at the network tab, um, data.json. And we want to still rely on that, but we want to write a translation layer to say, how can we now render the JS grid uh, on our screen instead of this thing? And so there's a few things that we need to do, but the, the place that we really need to do that um, is inside of this grid directive. And so if you remember, we have the grid directive, and the first thing that our interface did was uh, render uh, it as a table. And this is the template that, that basically translates that. Um, and so we can see here we have our columns being rendered in the table header, that's these guys, and then we have our rows being rendered, and then we have that editor initializer. So we want to replace all of this with something much simpler, uh, because JQ grid really doesn't require that much. All you need is an empty element, uh, and then you invoke this JS grid method. And so one of the, the ways that I've often done this in other projects is you learn a lot about the third party library, the API. Maybe you've used something like YUI data table or jQuery data table, or um, maybe you just used this JS grid. There's also like an ng grid. But you, you use it enough that you kind of research the third party API. You know sort of what the touch points are and what you need to do. And if we look very briefly at this, um, we need to select an element. We need to call the JS grid method. Uh, we have some metadata that we can use to define about things and features that we can turn on with these feature flags. Uh, and then there's uh, fields, which is their way of defining columns. So we need to translate our columns into their field structure, uh, where they have a name and a type, uh, and maybe even a width, if you want. Uh, and then there's also the actual data. Um, they're using this, this controller option with a DB. And so we'll take a look at, at what that looks like. So the first thing that we need to do is we, we're not going to use this as table anymore. Uh, we're going to use it as um, JS grid. So let me just create that quickly. Uh, we're going to create that file in templates. And we'll call it as JS 
grid.html. And there's not going to be much in that. We're just going to have a div uh, with an ID, no, with a class of JS grid. Uh, so let's see what that does right away. Right, nothing. Uh, we didn't have anything, so we basically replaced the entire template. Um, but that's step one, because uh, we're not going to be doing it as table, we're going to be doing it as JS grid. And the next thing that we need to do is we need to translate our um, our data somehow. So we have our rows and columns, and previously we were just binding the values for those directly to the scope because our as table referenced those things. We had the ng repeat for call and calls, uh, and again for row and rows, and then we were accessing like the field property and all that kind of stuff. We're not going to do that anymore, but we, we, we need to um, take our element and call JS grid on it. And so how do we do that? Well, we need to replace this with a control, uh, this controller, which doesn't have access to the element with a linking function. So let's do that. Let's call it link. And again, if you remember the signature for link, it's scope, element, attributes, and then potentially any of your controllers, if you remember from the first screencast. Um, so that should still all work, and we should still see uh, this show up, and we should still see our log show up. Oh, and it's not dollar scope, sorry. It's just scope. There we go. So we all we did was we changed it from a controller to a link uh, so that we get access to the element because we need to be able to invoke that JS grid method. So we can get rid of that log now. So previously, these two lines just bound it to the scope because uh, as table.html used um, rows and, and that was our interface. So now we want to grab the element, uh, which we have access to in the linking function. We want to call JS grid and we want to start crafting some of that information. So let's just do like the minimal example that we can do. Um, we'll make it with is 100% and uh, data is going to be rows and we don't ha shouldn't have to do any translation to that. And then fields, uh, which is JS grid's way of calling columns, we're going to have to do some translation. Um, but for now, we could just pass calls in and see what happens. So we don't need those two lines anymore. We don't need that. Uh, let's see what explodes. OK, right, I haven't actually included the JS grid library. So let me go grab those changes. And I'm just going to load them from the CDN. Let's put those into our index. And we'll load them right here. So I'm loading uh, the style sheet and the theme, which JS Grid uses from Cloudflare, and then also the, the JavaScript. Uh, let's see if that fixes that error. OK, cool. We actually got a different table. Um, but it doesn't look quite right. And the reason is because our data structure that we built up with the directives doesn't match the signature um, that uh, JS Grid uh, expects for its column definitions. And we can confirm that because if we look at, if we re-log out, uh, let me add that log back in here, ready to render, and we take a look at calls, we can see that um, our column definitions from the data were uh, title, and remember that first one is edit, so we'll have to fix that as well product and then field product and the JS grid mapping is lowercase name with uppercase version of the field name and then a type uh, and they use the type for the inline editing which we'll show after as well. Okay so we have a couple things to do first we need to translate uh, our fields into something that um, JS grid will understand. So how do we do that? And the way that I like to do that, we could do it in line here with a, with a function, um, but I like to extract those things um, and make them generalized so that if maybe we wanted to swap to a different uh, table library, we could do that. So let's create a service that's going to handle this sort of data translation layer for us. Uh, it's not a directive, a service. And let's call it grid data mapper. And that's going to return just an object, uh, and it's going to have a function on it called, let's call it 2JS grid fields. Um, you might argue that this could be 
generalized and that's too specific, but I think uh, the generalized portion is grid data mapper, which could be for whatever JS uh, JavaScript data table we're using. Um, so we're going to take in our columns and we're going to do some transformation on them. So let's call it fields, which is specific to JS grid. And let's say we're going to map over those columns uh, for each column. And we want to get, we want to translate it. So it's not going to be, um, what did we call it? We called it field and title, and they called it name. So we're going to say name is called up field. And I'm just going to hard code the type to text for now. Um, we didn't actually have a type, but uh, JS Grid will not support inline editing, which we want to add later uh, if we don't have that type. Uh, and then let's return those fields. Um, and I think actually for now we can just get rid of the temporary variable and return that. Okay, cool. So now we've got a service. So knowing what we know about Angular's dependency injection, we can grab the grid data mapper uh, and add it as a dependency of grid. And then instead of columns, we can say grid data mapper dot to JS grid fields and pass in the columns. And that should get us a mapping uh, that works a little bit better. Cool. So now we can see uh, that we have it in there. So we do have a problem though. Um, we, we have our our one column, if you remember the first column, uh, which was our way of indicating to the UI that we wanted that inline editor function. Uh, and that's still being populated onto that. So uh, I think we want to get rid of um, that thing. So let's see. Uh, we want to grab that. So let's go ahead and now that we now that we've got it rendering anyway, let's fix the inline editor portion. And we don't want to have to change this directive. We still want that to indicate that we want to use an inline editor. Um, but the the way that that's going to happen is going to change slightly. And if you remember correctly, uh, we look at that directive with inline editor, and the way that we did it before was we called a set editor method and we passed a column definition. And if we go look at set editor, uh, you can see that we just put a that column onto the very first column, or the very at the very first position in the columns array, and that's how we sort of manipulated the data to get our UI. So we don't we don't want to do that anymore. Um, so let's create a new method. So instead of calling set editor here, we're going to say it's still going to be here up at the controller. We're going to say use editor. Uh, and the reason this works is because um, JS Grid supports inline editing just as a feature flag on the configuration object that you pass to it. So if we just flip that to true, and let's get rid of these. Um, so now we need to go create that. So let's go back to where we called set editor. I'm going to leave that there. And we'll say use editor. Uh, use editor. And then on the scope, uh, we can say the same thing. So we're just going to store that value. Use editor equals use editor. So whether or not we want to use the editor, um, and the, the reason that we can hard code this to true here is because the presence of this attribute on the grid directive is essentially saying, uh, and the name of it is implying that we want that to be true. So that's why I hard coded it here because if we remove this uh, attribute directive, then uh, the inline editor wouldn't show up. Okay, cool. So that's one half. Now we've indicated that we want to use the inline editor uh, and our columns shouldn't be getting manipulated if we reload. Cool. So now we don't have that inline editor column. So now we need to translate with inline editor to the way that JS Grid expects it, which is this feature flag. So if we jump back to JS Grid, now we can add the editing. Uh, but we need a way to grab that value. And so the easiest way uh, I can think of is to go back to where we broadcasted that ready to render event. Um, and we're going to have access to it here because it lives in the grid screen controller. Again, it's sort of like the, the supervisor of knowing when things are going to be ready because it's the last directive to, uh, to get executed. Uh, so let's just pass that along. Let's say uh, use 
editor. And then we go back to where ready to render is and we need to add that as another argument. So use editor. And then we can say use editor. And cool. So we still don't have, um, if, you, if you notice, the last field definition here in the JS grid um, is another similar way in, in how we mapped a, a field or a column definition to show the controls. It's this column here, uh, which has like the edit button and which uh, the trash can and all that kind of stuff. So we still need to have that, but we need it to match um, the the signature. So let's go back to uh, where we're actually using that with use editor, right in with with inline editor, and let's do it in our grid data mapper. And let's say we're going to pass uh, because depending on whether we're using inline editor or not, our fields is going to change. So we could pass that as an argument here. And then uh, now I need that temporary variable fields equals this. Uh, and then at the very end, I'm going to return fields. And then I'm going to change it depending on uh, if we're using the editor or not. I'm going to do a very similar thing. I'm going to say fields unshift, which puts it at the first position. Uh, and the name is going to be edit and the type according to the JS grid API is going to be control. Um, and so now we've sort of uh, introduced uh, our data mapper to the concept of whether we're using an editor or not um, to know whether it can add the right uh, mapping for the control field that we're indicating by with inline editor. Let's see if that works. Uh, do I just not have it wide enough? Uh, I'm missing one more thing. Let's see. That should have put it on the very front. Uh, oh, I forgot to pass it in here. And this is uncovering a small design flaw. So now I have it and I can click, click edit. And now we have inline editing. Uh, so these were pants and color. I don't know, they were blue and they cost 50. Uh, I can hit that. Um, this is just client-side ed editing again, but JS Grid does support server-side editing and Ajax hooks and all that kind of stuff. So um, that is sort of concludes what I wanted to show you. I guess there's a few things that I don't like about this design, and maybe that could be the extra credit for, uh, for you to work on. So maybe how can we avoid having to pass around this use editor state all over the place? Because um, now it's bled into uh, our ready-to-render method. It gets pushed down into our data mapper, uh, and it's sort of being used to do a whole bunch of things, but being passed all over the place. Um, but that might be you know, a design question or, or, or a change that you could work on in your spare time. But I think the, the value proposition of what we've done is we didn't change the markup. Uh, we, we still have this exact same markup, um, but our output is completely different. And if we look at the diff, um, we really didn't have to make a whole lot of code changes. Again, a lot of these were related to um, the editor toggle and things like that uh, to get what we wanted. And I thought that that was really neat and, and just showcases how Angular works regardless of what the underlying implementation of what you want to do is, whether it's custom or whether you want to just, you know, say, I'm going to grab the element and I'm going to do a small mapping of to whatever third party library I'm using and push it out uh, and show the UI update that way. Uh, so really, really cool. Uh, you could do this with any library. And uh, the goal, again, isn't to say, oh, you should use Angular 1.4. And I know that a lot of things have changed. You could do this with Angular 2. You could do this with React or whatever. The goal is to think of your uh, UI or your markup that's defining your UI sort of in a declarative way um, as a, an interface to some third party library. And you need to work through the guts of the, the plumbing code to make that happen under the hood. And I think that that's a really powerful idea. Uh, if you have questions or comments, I'm going to put the code uh, for this in a pull request up on GitHub and you can check it out. Uh, and please let me know what you'd like to see next for a video. I'm going to get back into a regular cadence of doing these things. Thanks so much for subscribing and hope to see you next time for uh, another video on web development stuff. Thanks.